Lesson 13. Lucky 13. Um, welcome. Uh, the penultimate lesson. Um, so who has heard of the uh, Google Brain Residency Program? Yeah, it's pretty famous, right? It's been around for, I don't know, like maybe a year. That's one of the... I think it's probably maybe the top program to get into, the hardest deep learning program to get into the world. Um, the reason I mention it is uh, because it so happens one of our students was just accepted. So I'd like everybody to um, congratulate um, Sarah Hooker. Sarah Hooker is uh, a new Google Brain resident, and uh, I thought maybe we could have a brief chat with her to find out about her, um, her path to this uh, program. Sarah Hooker is uh, a new Google Brain resident. And uh, I thought maybe we could have a brief chat with her to find out about her um, her path to this uh, program. I'll throw over the green box. Try not to hurt anybody. Close enough. So, hello, congratulations, well done. You must be pretty excited. Um, very excited. It's almost a blur. I found out um, last week, actually. Yeah. Between yeah. Rapid sequence movements. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. This is a pretty huge thing to get into, so you must be like a machine learning PhD, been coding for a few decades, so forth, yes? So actually, not at all, and I think that's the um, exciting thing about the whole process is that really they're trying to find um, a diverse set um, of fellows, residents for the year, so there's many different buckets. There were definitely PhDs um, that I sat next to in the interview room, who were um, well published and incredibly accomplished. There were also undergraduates who this would be their first job after college. And my background was that um, I've been in industry. I started out in economic consulting, so I did economic modeling and statistics, and now I work as a data scientist. So how long, how long have you been coding for? So I've been coding two years. Wow. That also makes me very atypical in this group. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> it's been Rachel <laughs> told me you had a you had a, a, a fan moment when Ian Goodfellow uh, interviewed you. Is that true? <laughs> so I tried to keep it undercover, <laughs> but it was so thrilling. I think that was the the strangest thing about the whole process was that you're so nervous the whole time and yeah. you're so excited, but also you're talking to these people whose research you followed for years and so you're just my 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 google the hangout first hangout interview was actually with Hugo Larachelle and mm. I started learning about neural nets watching his MOOC so it was just it feels surreal and I think that's part of the intent of the program is to um, take very very different people at different parts of their career. Um, so so you told me that before you started this course your awareness of neural nets was a little bit of theory from a few blog posts. Uh, I mean, so how much has going through this course kind of helped you get the skills you needed to get into this program? Mm, uh, so I wasn't coding or implementing architecture before this course. So uh -huh. I'd done, I'd done, to be fair, like I, I was fascinated by deep learning for a while. So I did a I was pretty deep in the theory, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think part of why it was blog posts was that there wasn't a coherent body of work on right. the subject, and so um, now there's... But now there's Ian's book. Now there's Ian's book, which I have read back to back. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really a fantastic treatment, yeah. but I think that what this course offers, and I sense like many of you may have had the same experience, um, is the implementation, which was very new to me, and, and definitely... Um, uh, something I don't think I would have found in a different forum. Yeah, I mean, I know from um, talking to Rachel that some of the interview process was like, it, it actually sounded, the, the questions sounded like they came straight out of the course. It was like about how to do transfer learning and like all this kind of practical application stuff, it seemed like. Yeah, at least in my case, it was um, a, a fairly consistent breakdown throughout the process of theory, um, math questions, um, and then a project experience. And with the project, they're really trying to gauge um, implementation um, and your knowledge of, um, of basically concepts that we've 
covered um, very thoroughly in this class. Yeah. So overfitting, but um, uh, overfitting distribution, understanding like how to um, address uh, data distribution differences. Um, so that part, I, I, I think that that was standard throughout the whole process, mm -hmm. was that they expect um, you to, uh, they expect their candidates to uh, have this holistic approach of both coding, but also a strong foundation in the underpinnings. Um, so if I could give a, um, a pitch for your um, program, uh, one of the th amazing things that Sarah's done in her extraordinary life is to create a um, organization called Delta Analytics, which is applying data science for social impact um, projects. Um, is there room for people who might be interested to uh, contact you if they're interested in, in doing that kind of work? Absolutely. I would honestly, um, I think that the, the caliber of this course, I would be so thrilled to work with um, anyone from this course going forward. So like the way that it works, I'll just, um, we, we pair with nonprofits all over the world and you work with engineers and data scientists over a six month project. Um, and right now we are like involved with eight different nonprofits and then we'll start a new cycle towards the end of this year, so. Yeah, well, um, congratulations again. I think we're all so proud of you. Uh, thank you. So talking of, um, talking of great work, um, <clears throat> I also wanted to mention uh, the work of an, a, another student who also has the great challenge of having to deal with being a fast AI intern, being um, Brad. Um, Brad took up the challenge I uh, set up uh, two weeks ago in uh, implementing um, cyclical learning rates. Uh, you might remember that uh, the cyclical learning rates paper showed um, faster um, training of neural nets and also more automated. Um, and uh, Brad actually had it coded up uh, super quickly. Um, and so if you if you jump on the forum, you'll find a link to it there. Maybe Brad, you can add it to our wiki thread. Do we have a wiki thread yet, Rachel? Um, lesson 13. Lesson 13? Yeah. Could you create one? You just click at the bottom and say make wiki. Um, <clears throat> I, honestly, this, uh, as I mentioned when we first taught this, this paper has been so little looked at. We don't yet really know. Like. I have a feeling it's going to turn out that like this is the best way to train like every kind of neural net in every kind of situation. Um, so I've asked Brad to try as many possible experiments here, um, and he's going to try and keep automating it. This is exactly the kind of thing like Rachel and I at Fast AI are trying to do if this really works out. Is like get rid of the whole question of how to set learning rates, you know, um, which currently is such an artisanal thing. Um, so uh, yeah, so congratulations, um, Brad, on, on getting that working, and, and it worked really well in Keras, I think, you know, with the callbacks they had, um, the, the code ends up being quite quite neat as well. Uh, yeah, um, you've got something to add, please. Uh, I had this comment last time, but I'm feel so excited about these callbacks in Keras, because yeah. you could like uh, set callbacks to stop uh, training if it's like uh, if it stop uh, improving and then you can uh, enter another cycle to do different things and then kind of oscillate between the, like different ways yeah so the callbacks and fully automate this whole process so I kind of implemented similar like zigzag and things that you mm. know so it's, it's Keras is really cool in that like it's like basically 10 lines of code will uh, bring you so far with this callbacks yeah um, yeah absolutely and so remember you know that um, um, Keras has great source code, right? So if you look in your Anaconda, lib, Python, site packages, Keras directory, um, you'll find all the current callbacks. So when I said to, you know, gave Brad some tips as to how to get started, I said, you know, go here, look at the existing callbacks and uh, see if that helps you get started. Um, you know, anytime you want to build something in Keras, one of the best ways to get started is to read the source code for something that it already has that's somewhat similar to what you want to build. Um, and certainly with callbacks, that's an easy way to do that. Um, it's been a big week in deep learning as usual. Um, everything I taught you in this course is now officially out of date. Um, hopefully though, one of the things I have noticed is it's all building on stuff that we've been learning around about. <coughs> um, uh, had to begin to Brad for um, drawing my attention to this paper, which is a new style transfer paper, which can transfer to um, any style uh, in real time. 
uh, so you don't have to build a separate network uh, for each one. Um, this is the kind of thing which you could absolutely turn into an app. And obviously no one's done it yet because this paper just came out, so you could be the first one to say, you know, here's an app which can create any photo into any style you like. And honestly, I think um, this uh, third column is the, the new paper. Um, in my opinion, if you compare it to kind of the gold standard, which is the Gaddy's paper we originally looked at, I actually think it's maybe better. You know, um, like this one looks more styly. So does this one. Um, so there's an interesting paper. <clears throat> um, a lot of the basic ideas are the same, but uh, yeah, as you'll see, it's got some interesting approaches. Um, GANs have had a big step forwards. Um, uh, these, uh, this is the previous state of the art and face generation. Um, this is the new. As you can see, these are now pretty much at photorealistic, at least at 128 by 128. And these were only 64 by 64, the old state of the art. So um, this is a pretty exciting step forward in, in, in GANs. And as we've talked about, um, people use GANs at the moment to create pictures, but they can be used as a kind of additional loss function for any kind of generative network. Um, and so I think one of the things I always look for is what's under what's underappreciated, what's not being used much at the moment. And I would say GANs for a wider range of generative models. You know, so if you want to create a um, really great uh, super resolution thing, or if you want to create a really great um, automatic uh, line drawing creator, or you know, uh, colorization system or whatever, I think um, GANs are a good approach. Um, perhaps the most amazing one is this paper, um, which again we'll add onto the wiki, which does a bi-directional transfer even without matching pairs. Um, and so, for example, clearly this would not be possible to do if you required matching pairs. Take a Monet and turn it into a photo. Like, we don't have any data on how to do that because we don't have any photos of Monet, but as you can see it works incredibly well. Um, turn a zebra into a horse or a horse into a zebra. <laughs> summer into winter, winter into summer. Um, again, you know, this is a, a GAN-based system creating uh, photorealistic images or very uh, impressive artworks. Um, I think this approach to style transfer, you know, by putting a GAN layer is perhaps more interesting than the style transfer we've come up with so far because it really has to create a painting that, that can't be recognized as not being a real painting, otherwise the GAN will, will fail. So I think this is a really interesting approach to style transfer as well. Um, okay, so uh, really interesting week. These are all papers which I think any of you guys can, can tackle right now because they're all built on the things we've learned in this course. If anybody's interested in tackling any of them this week, that would be super fun to talk about it on the forum. Yes? Uh, just to clarify, is this last paper also the uh, again from the prior slide or is this a different paper? No, this is a different paper. I, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed that I didn't um, actually write on it where it comes from. Uh, let me do that. Actually, rather than me doing this, maybe um, somebody can try and find it because uh, I think I showed Brad and maybe Rachel have already seen it. I'll find it in my Twitter and put it on the wiki. Um, yeah. Cycle GAN, yeah, I knew it was something like that. There we go. Cycle game. Okay, this guy. Turns horses into zebras. Not really, just the pictures. Okay, thank you for the good question. Um, all right. Um, we've been talking about mean shift clustering a bit from time to time, and uh, so uh, we'll talk about it more next week in terms of applications, but the main application um, we've talked about so far is using it for um, a kind of faster pre-processing of really large data items like CT scans in order to find um, objects of interest, in this case lung nodules that might be cancers. Um, and uh, one of the things I mentioned that I was interested in was experimenting with combining uh, approximate, near, approximate nearest neighbors with, um, with mean shift clustering. And so to remind you, the basic idea was that <coughs> um, Here's our GPU version. Um, we went through each mini batch, and with each mini batch, we then basically did a um, a distance from every element in that mini batch to every single data item, and then we took the weighted sum of all the data items weighted by the um, weighted by the Gaussian um, on those weights. 
And uh, I pointed out that most, the vast majority of data points are far enough away that their weights are so close to zero that we could probably ignore them. So maybe we could have tried putting a, a approximate nearest neighbors step beforehand. So rather than adding up the entire data set, which could be a million points, it could just be the nearest hundred neighbors. Um, so I actually tried that during the week. Um, uh, this is basically what happens if you um, so there's an approximate uh, so uh, there's uh, I just used the existing scikit-learn.neighbors um, uh, algorithm so I haven't written my own PyTorch version um, I know one of you guys on the forum has already started writing a PyTorch version um, so I just tried a um, a ball tree which is a particular kind of approximate nearest neighbors and the basic idea is you say okay um, here's the data that I want you to index so that I can rapidly do nearest neighbors. Um, so now please do a query looking at, I don't know, the first 10 data points. And for each one of those 10 data points, show me the three nearest neighbors. And that returns something like this, right? Here are the 10 data points you passed in, and here are their three approximate nearest neighbors. And of course, um, all of the time itself is its own nearest neighbor, so that's why the first one is always kind of boring. Um, so then I thought, okay, that looks good. So then I um, just put that into the loop of our mean shift clustering. So I said, okay, each time we go through another epoch, um, index the data we have so far, so let's chuck it into a, one of these ball trees. And then um, when we do our um, distances, um, don't do them to every point, um, but instead do it into the nearest point. So I did this, um, did a query here to find the 50 nearest neighbors. Um, this then puts that into GPU. Um, I'm turning it into a tensor and dot cootering it. Um, so that gives me the list of the indexes, not the data itself. So the, interestingly, the hardest step was the one that seems like it should be the easiest, which is I had to then look up each of these indexes into the data to return the actual points, right? Now, easy enough to do if you just loop through it one step at a time, but we're trying to use the GPU here, right? If I, I tried doing it one step at a time, it made the thing take forever, because GPUs are not quick at doing things one step at a time. So I created a little um, batch-wise indexing function, which in the end, Rachel and I realized we could do actually with very, very little code. Um, so this is basically something where we could pass in our um, array and pass in our kind of matrix of indexes and it would return a three-dimensional tensor, basically, of every one of those points, for every one of those nearest neighbors, for every one of those dimensions. So that was the only bit that was remotely tricky. Other than that, so that's this function. Other than that, the rest of the code is the same. So this worked in the sense that it sped things up, um, but it didn't work in the sense of the result. Here was the input we gave it, and <clears throat> here's the output. Now what's happened is it turns out each one of these little colored dots actually now represents 50 points. So what it's done is it's, it's taken me too literally, right? It's basically found the 50 nearest neighbors to each point and created a cluster of 50 points. And once it's created these clusters of 50 points, it's now stuck, right? There's no way for it to cluster these any further because every time it now goes nearest neighbors, it says, oh, there's 50 points that are right on top of you. So um, I mentioned this to basically show the kinds of things that can, can go wrong, and hopefully by next week this will be fixed. Um, you know, it's like when I described this problem, this seemed like it was clearly going to work, and then as soon as I saw this picture, I immediately saw that it couldn't possibly work. You know, um, so this is kind of the nature of trying things out. But the interesting thing is, I now realize that the solution to this will be way faster than this, right? The solution is what Rachel describes as an approximate approximate nearest neighbors, right? Which is something that doesn't return the 50 probably nearest points, but returns 50 points which probabilistically closer ones are more likely to be there. But there are like zero guarantees, like we want it to be less good. So, you know, if you're interested during the week, if one of you wants to try creating an approximate, approximate nearest neighbors algorithm, I think it'll basically be a case of taking like LSH or ball tree or something and like removing a lot of the code, you know, removing the code that makes it better. Um, so I, I hopefully, you know, next week we'll see this <laughs> working, but I thought it'd be interesting to see the, 
you know, the intermediate stage. And actually, this kind of thing of like showing you the failures, like you don't get to see most of the failures. So um, I was working with some of the students over the weekend on implementing something that we'll see um, later on uh, today. Um, and actually on Saturday afternoon I was sitting with Melissa going through some of this coding, and at the end of that Melissa was like, oh wow, it's really interesting to see the process, <laughs> because it's like you come in on Monday and it's all just working, where else we spent the entire Saturday afternoon like slowly going through one step at a time and constantly making mistakes and going back and trying to see what happened. And so yeah, the actual process of everything you see in class getting it working is full of failures. Um, and in fact, uh, Brad is currently working on building one of the two things we're doing for next week, and he just came up to me before class, and he's like, yeah, it's finished running, and nothing worked at all. <laughs> you know, and I was like, yeah, of course, nothing ever works at first time. <laughs> and so part of the process is, you know, something I've been trying to kind of talk to Brad about with, you know, with his work is like, recognizing that every time you build something new, it won't work, means that you need, you need to build it in a very different way, right? Like, write an IPython notebook as if you're going to be teaching it that next Monday's class, right? Because, because it won't work the first time, you're then going to have to go back and be like, which one of these steps failed, right? So at every step, you want to be printing out the results, summarizing the, you know, the key statistics, drawing pictures, writing down the reasoning that you did things, you know, so that then when it doesn't work, you can go back and be like, okay, we're, where did this go wrong? Or even better, hopefully, seeing the mistake earlier on rather than waiting until it's all finished. Um, so there's a whole lot of like data science process steps, which um, you know those of you that have worked with data scientists will be pretty familiar with by now, hopefully. And those of you that haven't, um, it's really a case of bringing in the software engineering mindset. You know, lots of testing, lots of iterations. Um, the more data scientists can learn about software engineering practices, I think, the better. Um, so <clears throat> very interestingly, uh, today or maybe yesterday, um, uh, Facebook just announced that they have implemented an enormous improvement in the state of the art and approximate nearest neighbors. Um, uh, so you can check this out if you like, uh, F-A-I-S-S, -S, nice. Um, by the way, everything I mentioned here, I've mentioned earlier on Twitter, right? So if you follow me on Twitter or keep an eye on my Twitter account, you'll, you'll see all these things first, um, regardless of whether class is still running or not. So this was particularly interesting to me, you know, A, because I've been talking quite a bit during this part of the course about approximate nearest neighbor. Um, it's actually really important for deep learning. And you can get a sense of how important it is by how much uh, Facebook have invested in this, right? This is a multi-GPU distributed uh, approximate nearest neighbor system that runs about 10 times faster than the previous state of the art. Now I happen to get a particular insight into this, because earlier this week uh, I was at a um, conference at, at Berkeley, and thanks very much to Melissa for um, letting me know about the conference. Um, and thanks very much to the people at the conference for letting me in the day before when it had been full for months. Um, and I uh, chatted to um, Jan LeCun, um, and uh, I chatted to him about this uh, uh, thing I'd been thinking about a lot during this part of the course about transfer learning, you know, and like, you know, how come people seem to always use VGG for, for the best transfer learning results when there are so much better systems around? And you know, I've been really coming to this conclusion that the reason is that fully convolutional nets like ResNet and InceptionNet um, have very, very large, very, very redundant intermediate representations. So because they don't have a fully connected layer, like in ResNet, the penultimate layer is 7 by 7 by 2000, right? which A is huge, and B, if you look through that 7 by 7, most of them are the same, more or less, as their neighbors, right? because most parts of an image are similar. So, um, you know, and if you, and if you want to go back and far enough through enough bottleneck layers that you actually get a fairly general representation, like we do with VGG when we go to the first fully connected layer, you're at like 28 by 28 by 500. You know, they're far too big to work with and far too redundant. 
So I, I asked Jan Lacoon about this, and I said, you know, is anybody working on the question of like how do you capture the benefits of these much more accurate architectures, but create um, efficient distributed representations? Um, and uh, Jan Lacoon is like, yes, absolutely, of course. It's like, where do I read about it? And he's like, well. We use it in Facebook all the time. Like at Facebook, we take every object in Facebook and we create a compressed distributed representation of it and we save it in databases and then we give little bits of code to all the groups so that they can create simple linear models on top of these distributed representations and like this is everywhere in Facebook. And I was like, oh, so is this written down somewhere? So, I don't know, maybe it's in a technical report somewhere. Um, it, it's, I don't know, it's like one of these things that I, I knew it must be happening, and so now I know at least one company, very, very big company, that it's happening at a huge scale. And so when they say here that this is used to search for multimedia documents that are similar to each other, if we read between the lines, they're not talking about looking at pixels or samples of audio, they're talking about um, activations. You know, distributed representations. Uh, and we know now, like, when we've talked about perceptual losses, for example, how much better it is when you capture similarity using activations than you do using pixels. So here's a huge opportunity for deep learning, which, uh, sure, um, you know. Yeah, I, I was uh, I read briefly a YouTube paper in which they say something like, and I'm, you know, I'm asking you because maybe you have a better insight on how this is done. I have been very interested in understanding it better. So they they basically do some kind of embedding of the user, an embedding of a video, mm. which is probably something kind of similar to mm. this. Mm. And then so they first build this this uh, kind of representation of every user and every video, and then on top of that they have another deep learning network that actually does everything else. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so I mean, at, at YouTube my understanding is most of their embeddings are based on um, more of a collaborative filtering approach, like we did in Lesson 4. Um, I'm not sh I, to my knowledge, they're not doing um, actual video features, um, as far as I know. Um, but there's no reason they shouldn't be, um, so I now know that Facebook absolutely are, right? And so. Thinking, uh, thinking about this, uh, like I thought about this many years in a medical context, you know, medical imaging, every, every medical image you have, you have a compressed distributed representation of it, such as the first fully connected layer of VGG. Um, it's stored in a database, um, and when I say a database, I actually mean a um, fast indexed approximate nearest neighbors um, tree or structure, and now you can go and grab, you know, every medical image that displays similar symptoms to this medical image or whatever, right? Like, yeah, a guy from Kaiser is giving me the thumbs up. So exactly. So um, this, this kind of stuff is really exciting. And it's like, as far as I know, it hasn't really been written down anywhere, um, and it's not really being used anywhere much uh, other than at least Facebook and probably Google does this too. <clears throat> okay. So that's just a bit of background. Um, we are going to talk about the bi LSTM hegemony. And uh, these slides come from Chris Manning. Who here has come across Chris Manning before? Yeah, quite a few of you. So, Chris um, is a linguistics professor at Stanford. Um, he did his PhD in linguistics. Um, and at some point in the last small number of years, he discovered that everything he learned about ling linguistics was basically a waste of time because now you can throw a um, bi-directional LSTM with attention at pretty much anything and get a better result than everything from his PhD in linguistics. So nowadays he actually teaches um, deep learning and in fact his uh, deep learning for natural language processing videos just went online today. So if you um, want to learn more about that, um, feel free. Um, <clears throat> um, so uh, at this conference last week, um, this is one of the slides he put up. Uh, he he is described himself as pretty disappointed about the situation. It's not where he wants linguistics to be, but um, there it is. And so this is what we're going to learn about today: um, bidirectional LSTMs with attention. Um, so this is what happened when people started throwing bidirectional LSTMs with attention at neural translation. 
this looks a lot like the 2012 ImageNet picture. Um, the red is the kind of two generations ago approach to um, um, statistical machine translation, phrase-based. Um, the purple is the last four years of the pre you know, next generation approach, which is syntax-based um, statistical machine translation. Neural machine translation didn't really appear properly until 2015, and this is the path that that's now on. And we're probably well beyond that now because, of course, Google's um, neural machine translation system is now online, and a lot of the stuff that's coming out of that is appearing in papers now. So, um, actually, back here in about 2013, I actually gave a talk at one of the academic conferences, um, which was like an um, introduction to deep learning for people in the statistics academia who maybe weren't familiar with it. One of the things I told them was, all of you who are in NLP, start learning deep learning now because there's no question in the next three years or so it's going to be the state of the art and pretty much everything. Um, so hopefully some of those people listen to me and today they're very happy. Um, like Even though we couldn't exactly tell at that point how that was going to happen, it was just really, really obvious that it's like, you know, it's a it's a system which you know uses distributed representations and you know um, has all of the properties that you would expect to see in something where deep learning will be successful. Um, and you know today, um, I think increasingly people are realizing that large areas of classic statistics and machine learning are in the process of being replaced. So Chris, these are all Chris slides still. Uh, Chris described the four big wins of neural machine translation, um, and I think one of the most interesting ones is number three, which is the statistical approaches tended to use um, like uh, n-grams. So like these three words appear, these three words appear, these three words appear next to each other in these situations. <coughs> you can't get beyond about five grams, so a list of five words, um, because you just get this total exponential explosion of how big that data set is. With RNNs, remember when we very first learned about RNNs, we talked the reason why? Stateful, memory, long-term dependencies. Right? So this is exactly what you want if you want to make sure that your verb tense and everything else lines up with your you know, details of your subject, they could be 20 words apart or more. Right? So we need to be able to have that kind of state. So this is where this uh, works very well. Interestingly, um, and you know, I'm not deep in the NLP world, so I, I wasn't quite clear on where things are with all of the states that say the art. Um, Chris said in his talk, by LSTMs with attention are the state of the art for basically everything. Right? And so, um, um, well, we actually have an NLP person here. Can I ask you a quick question, Anna, about this? Um, can you pass that to Anna? <laughs> um, is, is, is this kind of line up with your experience? Uh, uh, you're, you're like I mean, an NLP researcher. Yeah, yeah, so my research is mostly in uh, information extraction, but you know, first of all, if Chris Manning says that, it's true. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but also... Um, Just I, move that a bit closer to yeah. you. Uh, so the other part of this is that in some of those uh, areas, while um, while this is state of the art, definitely the state of the art is not that impressive. So that's oh, yes. the second part. That's definitely true that as well. I say. But he's right. Like this is what's happened. People have found that for all those tasks, yeah, um, and others which are not listed there, um, which are kind of similar in certain ways. That is the state of the art. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Um, what Anna was talking about about the kind of disappointing state of this. So like on one of these slides, actually Chris Manning had a big frowny face and one of the audience was like, what's with the frowny face? And he's, you know, and he's basically describing all of the ways in which the state-of-the-art results still are far short of where we want them to be. So you know, NLP is by no means solved. You know, we could kind of say basic image recognition is kind of solved, but basic NLP is not really solved. Um, but here's a great example Chris gave of something that you know um, this approach has worked really well for very difficult task. It is to read a story like this, right? And then in the story highlights, um, one of the words or what phrases is deleted, and the um, the neural net has to figure it out. So if Star Wars is deleted, it'll be characters in mm, movies have gradually become more diverse, and you have to predict Star Wars. So this is a challenging um, problem that really requires some in-depth understanding. And um, 
the work that Chris uh, showed, and actually he was a um, senior researcher on, is to basically take the query, uh, chuck it into an embedding, um, take the entire story, chuck it into an RNN, uh, take the RNN that comes out, do the whole thing with attention, and that's it. Right? So, so let's talk about how to do this. Um, So there's a really nice um, article on distill.pub um, which has a, a bit of a picture of this. <laughs> so imagine we're translating English into French. So here's our English, right? And so we're trying to translate um, the European economic area. So the is la, right? But the is la because of the gender of the noun area. So you see these little purple lines here. This is showing that this neural network model has learnt that when it is looking at translating um, um, the area, and specifically the, it also needs to look at the word area in order to figure out that it's la. So these um, purple lines are showing the um, weights in the neural network um, for translating that particular word. Right? So when it was translating signed, this is what I was talking about long term long distance dependencies, it's not just using the word signed but also looking at what was signed in order to figure out the details of how to how to use this verb. Right? And then some things you know, you kind of need to look at co combinations. So, was signed, you know, you, you have multiple prepositions working together, right? So, we need to come up with a, a, an architecture which is capable of learning these attention weights, right? So, as we mentioned last week, um, this really fun paper called Grammar as a Foreign Language, um, Jeffrey Hinton was a senior researcher on this one, has a nice little summary. Uh, it, this is not where it originally came from, but it has a nice little summary of how attention works. Um, so let's, let's go through it. Like we don't often go through, um, we don't often go through things by looking at the math, but I think in this case, you know, the math is simple enough. Um, that this is actually maybe a, a good practice. So let's start off by looking at the notation. Okay, so there's an encoder, right? So remember the encoder is the RNN, or number of layers of RNN, which are going to look through the original source sentence, so in this case the uh, English sentence, and it's going to spit out a hidden state Right? And if in Keras we say return sequences equals true, we'll get a hidden state after every single um, English word. Okay? So if you've got 10 words in the English sentence, we'll have 10 pieces of encoder state. So the encoder state, they're going to call it H. Right? And see here, remember these um, things that are underneath or on the top generally uh, are just the same as in NumPy is putting things in square brackets, right? So what they're doing here is they're telling us that TA, sorry, they're using a TA is the number of words um, in the English sentence, right? So we've got one through TA bits of state, each one's called H. <clears throat> so that's the encoder hidden state. And then the decoder, as you run through each step, trying to translate this thing into French, is getting its own, creating its own hidden state. That's going to be called D, right? And D will go as far as TB. That'll be the highest index of the French sentence. So in the end, uh, our goal is to um, replace uh, every one of these. So we can write these as DT, meaning each one of these um, items of decoder state. Um, we're going to try and create something called d-t, which is going to represent the result of this 
um, attention process, right? So basically, it's going to represent the uh, the word in this case the, the uh, representation in the hidden state of the word for area weighted quite a lot and economic weighted a little bit and everything else not much at all so not surprisingly the way to do that is with um, oops, Daisy, is with a weighted sum right so here remember h that's our encoder state, right? So that's the state from the R and N run over that English sentence. Okay, so um, the word for area and so forth. Uh, yes, Rachel. Now we have a question. To clarify, in this case, instead of creating one condensed representation vector that captures the entire English sentence, yeah. here are we just looking at the existing hidden states that get generated as the English sentence is processed word by word? Yeah, exactly. It's just a difference between return sequences equals true versus return sequences equals false. So with true, it just throws away everything except the last state. Uh, sorry, with return sequences equals false, we throw away everything except the last state. Return sequence equals true is keep all the ones in the middle. And remember, importantly, this is a bi LSTM, a bi directional LSTM, right? So we've got one LSTM going forward through the sentence and another one going backward through the sentence. So every one of these pieces of encoder hidden state represents um, all of the words before it in that order and all of the words after it. In reverse order, stuck together, and remember also it's been layered. So there's like quite a few layer, you know, layers of, of non-linear neural net layers going on. Right? So that's what this state um, comes from. So yeah, so each each element of H is already a pretty complex calculation to get there, pretty sophisticated calculation. And so we're going to take those and we're going to multiply them by some weight, some weight. Um, uh, and the weight, see how the weight's got two indexes on? That means that the weight depends on two things. One is t, which is which word in the French translation am I trying to create right now? And i, which is which piece of encoder hidden state am I currently calculating the weight for? Right? So, and because this is being calculated um, with a function, you know, um, in if we were doing this in Python, we'd probably be you know writing like get weight um, you know t comma i right and so the line above it tells you how to go about calculating that weight right and it tells you not surprisingly that to calculate that weight we're going to be using softmax. And we're going to be using softmax on top of some other function. So why softmax? Well, if we're doing a weighted sum, we want the weights to add up to 1. That's one reason. Secondly, most of the time in translation, the thing that you're translating is largely just one word. Right? So 1992 is translated as 1992. I don't even know how to say that. That's uh, you know that's uh, just August, right? But then sometimes it's mainly one word like in, but a little bit of some others. So a softmax because it's e to the something divided by sum of e to the something. Um, remember, it tends to be very big uh, for just one item in the vector and fairly small for everything else. So by using softmax, we we capture that quite naturally. So that's why, that's why we use softmax to calculate these weights. Right. So softmax of u, right? u is another function, or the result of another function. And what is this? This is just a multi-layer perceptron with one hidden layer, a neural net with one hidden layer. If you have a look, it's a couple of bits of data multiplied by weight matrices, put through a nonlinearity, multiplied by another weight matrix, put through another nonlinearity. So that's the definition of a neural net with one hidden layer. So when it all comes down to it, what this all says is 
In order to calculate the weights on each of the source encoding words for each of the target translated words, train a tiny little neural net with one hidden layer which learns to figure out which source words to translate now. Okay? And so remember one of the things that Chris mentioned in his like, what, why is neural machine translation good? One of his reasons was because it's end-to-end -end trainable. We're going to embed this mini neural net inside the bigger RNN so that the whole thing is going to be just SGD'd all in one go. Okay? So that's what we're going to try and do. So I just want to make sure that's clear before we look at the code for how to do it. If anybody wants, yeah, okay, a couple of questions there and there. Uh, just quick. Uh, so, how is a uh, hidden state looks like? Is it like set of activations or? Like yeah. So the hidden state is just a normal LSTM hidden state. Mm -hmm. So it's just a vector. Right? Okay. Um, if we go back to, um, we've got a question right over there. Um, <laughs> So anytime like, you want to remind yourself of what's really going on with RNNs, go back to this Lesson 5 RNN PowerPoint, because we go through it and we remember like, okay, this is not an RNN, you know, here's a basic neural net, and we could like have a multi-layer neural net, and then we can have a multi-layer neural net in which we have a second input coming in, still not an RNN. We could have two things coming in at two different times. And then we could also tie these weight matrices. And the, the notebook that goes with this class, we do all this like by hand in Keras with all the weight tying and everything, so you see every step. And then we realize, oh, that last picture could have been drawn like that. Right? And we also realize we could do this as well. Right? So so all of these circles represent yeah, just a bunch of activations, just a vector of activations. And so we have a bunch of these layers um, until eventually we decide to keep some final set of activations. So this is this is all we're doing. Yes? So then the, uh, I don't know what to call it, the attentional model there. Yep. It's relatively simple, it's just a single, single like, hidden, layer. hidden layer. Is yep. there a reason that it wasn't more complex or some fancy architecture? You know, I've been wondering that myself. I don't know. Um, I guess the answer is it seems to work. You know, um, there's no reason you couldn't have uh, two hidden layers. Um, I guess you know it, it, it's so easy to um, go back and look and see what the attentions are, and presumably so far the way people are using this, they're finding that the attentional model is getting the correct stuff. I think if you try and do an attentional model for something else and that doesn't happen, I'd say, yeah, chuck another layer. Um, in fact, um, this, uh, this terrific um, post actually shows a really cool example of this, which is on the bottom here is a sound wave, um, and on the top is the speech recognition. And so you know, people are actually using attention models to automatically do speech recognition by figuring out uh, which parts of the sound wave represent which letters. Um, and in fact, one of the super cool things to come out um, um, this, uh, this week was the, uh, the Tacotron, um, which is one of the best uh, names for a paper I've come across. Um, and the Tacotron um, has some fantastic examples, actually, of um, what it sounds like. Uh, let me see if I can get this. Basilar membrane and otolaryngology are not autocorrelations. So the cool thing here is like um, it changes depending on like where the punctuation is pretty impressively, or even whether there's capitals. Check this out. The buses aren't the problem, they actually provide a solution. The buses aren't the problem, they actually provide a solution. Or questions. Does the quick brown fox jump over the lazy dog? So, with this kind of end-to-end -end training, um, like this, right, you don't have to really 
build anything special to make that happen. You just need to make sure that your labeled data um, is correct. Um, and actually, somebody pointed out something really neat the other day, which is if you want to build a speech recognition system, like one easy way to do it would be like um, grab some audible.com audiobooks and the actual books, and like you could have 40 hours of training data like that, right? In fact, if you grab Stephen Fry reading Harry Potter, then you could like have uh, every Harry Potter voice as well. Um, <clears throat> so this is a this is a super amazing technique, and surprisingly enough, um, this uh, single hidden layer seems to be um, enough to do attention pretty well. Um, so last week we were looking at the, the spelling bee, right, where the um, inputs were. Th um, Things like z, w, i, ki, and we were having to figure out to spell it z, w, ki. Um, we tried it without attention and we didn't get great results. We looked at the paper from the original um, Badenow et al. Um, paper that showed that with longer sentences in particular, you get much better results if you do use attention. Um, so let's have a look and see what that looks like. So um, Keras doesn't really have anything. To do this effectively, so I had to write something. Um, so before I show what I wrote, let me describe kind of what it looks like. Um, most of it looks exactly the same as the original spelling bee model. Um, we have our um, list of phonemes uh, as input. We have our list of um, letters to spell the word with as our um, decoder decoder input. Um, we chuck them both uh, through um, embeddings. Um, uh, we then do bidirectional um, RNN on the phonemes, and then we chuck an RNN on top of that, and chuck an RNN on top of that. Right? You might remember from last time this get RNN function, just to remind you, is just something that's returning an LSTM. Right? And by default, we're saying return sequence equals true. Right? So last week, the final one was get RNN false. We put everything into a single little package, and then we, we fed that to the RNN. But now we're leaving um, return sequences equals true all the way through, so that we can then pass it to this special attention layer that I created. Um, we'll look at how this works in a moment, but um, let's first of all talk about like what does an intention layer need? Um, it needs to know um, what kind of RNN layer do you want it to create? Right? So I just pass it a function which creates an RNN layer. Okay. Um, in your decoder, how many layers do you want to create? So I say, okay, create three LSTM layers in the decoder. And then what information is it going to need to create that? It's going to need the all of the um, encoder state. So that's just sitting in here. Um, and then we can do something else. To make it easier. We can do something called teacher forcing. And teacher forcing is we are going to pass it, um, as well as the encoder state, we're going to pass it the answer, but we're going to pass it the answer for the previous time period. Right? So in other words, if we're trying to learn how to spell the wiki, at step one we're not going to pass it any letter. At step two, we'll pass it Z. At step three, we'll pass it Y. At step four, we'll pass it W. In other words, we're going to tell it what the previous time step's correct answer was. Why do we do that? It makes it much easier to train, particularly early on. Right? Early on, it has no idea how to spell, and so it gets most things wrong most of the time. And so the the later letters. Everything's wrong before it, so how can it possibly know what letter to use now? Right? Um, so with teacher forcing, we're going to take our um, thanks, Rachel. We're going to take our um, input uh, data, being all of those encoder hidden states, but we're also going to tell it, all right, even if you got the previous letter wrong, this is what it should have been. Right? And so it's just it's going to make it a bit easier for it. And all we do is we just concatenate together the hidden state plus that, um, that decoder input. So that's called teacher forcing. Right? You don't have to use teacher forcing, but if you do, it just makes it faster and easier to train. 
So that's why we pass in this uh, special um, decoder input. And just to show you, the decoder input uh, here, right? Um, the decoder input Mm. Ah, okay, yeah. So it's all of my labels, right? Except not the very last one, right? So that's going to be one less than the full number of um, um, items to spell, letters to spell. And then I concatenate a column of ones onto the front. Now, why is it a column of, uh, well, sorry, ones times? Go token, and then Go token was something that I set up back here. Um, there we are. I decided that an asterisk, right? So an asterisk is going to be like a special character, which means this is the start of the word. Right? So we're going to get past every time. We're going to get past if it was the wiki, we'd get past asterisk. Z Y W I C K. Right? So that's going to be this teacher forcing input. Okay, so this attention layer is going to create a three layer RNN. It's going to get given all of the encoder state. It's going to get given that special um, decoder input. Um, and it's going to spit out um, just a list of states again. Um, and so we can just do the usual thing of doing a time distributed dense um, with our appropriate vocab size um, softmax to turn that into um, our target activations. So putting aside how we calculate this, everything else is pretty familiar. Um, so we can then just go ahead, build that model, compile it, fit it, um, passing in both the um, the phonemes and those decoder inputs, train it for a while, a bit of annealing, train it a bit more, uh, until eventually we have actually a pretty good accuracy, 51%. Um, and uh, here it is. Did you have a question, Rachel? Yes, there's a question. Do you know if the current work strictly uses the hidden states of the final RNN layer, or if people tried using attention sums over different indices over multiple layers, the way we did with using perceptual loss for multiple layers? You know, that's actually a great question. Um, the answer is, to my knowledge, people are always using the last layer hidden state, um, but I kind of accidentally used all of them once and got some better results. So. I don't know if I screwed something up or if this is a good idea. So that might be something if you want to test it, you know, to, to try it out. Um, yeah, I was like, after fixing a bug, things got worse, <laughs> which is never a good sign. Um, so maybe it's not a bug after all. Um, so I remember last time we had trouble with the really long words, um, lots of phonemes, but here's 11 phonemes and it's done it perfectly. Right? So that's, that's a good sign that this is handling some longer ones pretty well. And, you know, is 51% good or bad? I don't know, right? Because, like, spelling is, you know, uh, is not exact, right? There's no way you could algorithmically get 100% spelling, right? Like, is it meant to be speak like this or speak like this? This is from a test set, remember, right? There's no way for it to know. So I think it's done um, pretty well. So. The only thing remaining is how to do this attention layer. So the bad news is that the attention layer is the um, uh, largest um, um, the largest uh, custom layer we've looked at. I mean, it's not terrible, but it's uh, it's a hundred lines of code, right? Um, but a lot of it's kind of pretty repetitive, um, so it really depends how interested you are a in custom layers and b in attention as to how much you want to look at this. Um, but basically, I'll show you the key pieces. Right? Um, there are two really important methods that get called in your custom layer, and they are build and call. Build is the um, method that's called in your custom layer 
when your layer is actually inserted into a neural network and that, that causes it to get built, right? When, once it's inserted into a, into a Keras neural network, it, that's the point at which it knows how big everything has to be, right? Because you told it how big the input was, and then you've got you know, the various layers connected to each other, and so eventually you can figure out how big is, you know, in fact, specifically, what is the shape of the input, right? So when your build method is called, you get told what is the shape of your input. And this is the point where you now have to set everything up to work with that input shape. Right? So in this case, build gets called as soon as it finishes running this line, right? because it knows that it got this input, right? and it can figure out this input shape by going all the way back through all this. Right? Now we have two inputs, right? we have the encoder state and the decoder input. So we can pull those apart into the encoder shape and the decoder input shape. So some things which seem like they might be hard actually are incredibly easy. To create my three layers of RNNs is a single line of code. Right? Remember I just passed in the RNN generating function, right? so I just call it for each layer. Right? And with the list comprehension I now have there is three RNN layers in a list. That was easy. On the other hand, to do this, I'm going to have to do it all by hand. Right? And in fact, there's some things that are being hidden here. For example, um, a bias term is not included here. Right? But we definitely want one. Right? Like, people often don't include bias terms because you, like, you can always um, uh, avoid it by like, adding a column of ones to your data. Um, so like it's common in math not to mention the bias term, but generally speaking, any time you see um, a neural net, unless they state otherwise, there's probably a bias term there. Um, so we have to, um, in build, we're going to have to create w1, w2, and v. Right? Um, <clears throat> to create them, Keras actually has uh, a convenient method that comes from the layer superclass called addWeight. Right? So at weight you basically say, okay, what's the size of the weight matrix, what's your initialization function, and give it a name. So I just took that and called it W. Right? So here I just go www, right? passing in, alright, so W1, how big is that going to be? Uh, w2, how big is that going to be? Here's my bias, how big is that going to be? Here's my v, how big is that going to be? And then I've got two other things here, which is a w3 and a b3, and that's because this is kind of hand waved over something, which is this final answer um, basically needs to become the hidden state right, of your next layer of the RNN, but it might not be the right size. So then I just added one more um, transformation to the end um, to basically make it the right size. Um, and in some of the attention model papers they do lay that out, so I don't know like whether Hinton's group just ignored it, or maybe they built it so that the shapes worked anyway, I don't know. Um, so we've got one extra, one extra affine transformation. Um, a minor note, um, for those of you who are playing with PyTorch, I'm sure you've discovered how cool it is that you can go self.addmodule and it keeps track of like everything that you need to train, all the parameters. Um, Keras is not so clever, um, so that's why we have to go self.add weight for every one of these weights, because um, Keras has to know what to train. When you optimize, what should you train? Unfortunately, when we created all these RNNs, these RNNs have lots of weights which we haven't told Keras that we need to optimize them. So I actually hadn't, I have not found any examples of custom layers anywhere on the internet where people have actually done this, um, but I figured out what you can do is you can basically, um, I created this little function that goes through every one of my layers, every one of those RNN layers, and finds all of the attributes that um, Keras needs to know about. So it needs to know what are the trainable weights, non-trainable weights, losses, updates, and constraints. So anyway, you can copy and paste this code. If you want to create a custom layer 
which itself contains some Keras layers, copy and paste this code, and it seems to work. Um, that was really annoying. Okay, so that's uh, the first main thing you have to create when you create a custom layer is build. Um, creating build is really boring because you have to get all these bloody dimensions to be correct, which is a pain in the ass. And so when I built that, I had this little bunch of like TensorFlow playing around code where I would just keep going in and being like, okay, if this is the size of my X, this is the size of my W1, let's try, you know, doing each calculation. So I like did each calculation in a cell, one step at a time, and, you know, looked to see what all the shapes were, and then went back and put them in. So, you know, like, I don't think any normal mortal person can, like, write all of these dimensionalities and actually get them to work without doing them one little step at a time. So, um, make things easy for yourself. So the other key thing that happens in a layer is to call call, and call is the thing that uh, basically that's your it's your forward pass. Right? This is like okay, this is calculate, go calculate, and so you get passed in the data to calculate on, right? So um, in this case, um, we actually have to. Um, step through the steps of an RNN. Um, and Keras actually has a um, k.rnn function, which is very, very similar to theano.scan. You guys remember theano.scan? This is basically something which it calls some function for each step, it steps through each part of your input, has some initial states, um, and so forth, right? It's it's almost identical to Theano.scan, right? It's a really low-level thing, and so um, Keras um, really doesn't have a convenient user-facing API for like creating custom RNN code. In fact, this is something which nobody's really figured out yet. Um, um, TensorFlow has uh, just released a new kind of custom RNN API, um, but there isn't yet any documentation for it. Um, so I was hoping to teach it in this course, but I think it's just a little too early, um, and I don't know if it's good or not. So you know, this is this is like a bit of an open question, really. Is like how do you create something as easy to use as Keras, but with the flexibility to design your own? Kind of R and N details, you know. And as you can see in this case, it wasn't it wasn't convenient at all. You know, I had to go back and kind of you know run this scan function from scratch and set everything up from scratch. Anyway, so basically all the work happens in here, which means all the work is happening in this step function I created. So here's where the actual calculations are done. So here's my step function. And so in the end, when it actually gets to it, this is now looks a lot like um, the hint and teams code, right? Um, we basically can see us doing the the dot and at the bias, and here's the than, and here's the um, the v and the softmax, and here's the bit where we do the weighted sum, right? And then this is this one extra step I mentioned, which is to get it to the right shape for the R and N again. And so now that I've done all of that pre-processing, right? To basically I've started with x. And I ended up creating this thing called H. You can now go ahead and go through all of those three um, RNNs, um, calling step on each of those. Okay, so that's you know this probably shouldn't have been that hard in the end, um, but it's just the nature of kind of the, the Keras API for this stuff that it doesn't really exist that we had to go in and, and create it. You know, all we really wanted to do was say, okay, Keras, before you run the three decoder RNNs, take your input and modify it in this way. Right? Um, so that's, um, but we have to do it for every step. You know, that's basically what was missing, is some way in Keras to easily stay, say, like, change the, the step. Um, so I've spoken to Francois, you know, the Keras author about this, he's well aware that this is not convenient right now and he really wants to fix it, but I mean, it's, this is difficult to get right, and no one's quite done it yet. So, 
Um, we have a question. Um, I didn't get the getting it to the right shape again part. Could you explain that again? Sure. So step, thank you for the question. Um, step is being called for every time step. So at the end of it, we have to return the new hidden state. And then that new hidden state is going to come back into the next step. right? So in other words, the thing that we end up with here needs to be the same shape as we had um, here. Right? So, um, but it, that doesn't happen you know, automatically um, because we're actually taking um, this, um, this weighted sum and we're actually concatenating onto it the, uh, you know, the decoder input. Uh, we end up with something that's um, a totally different shape. So, but you can always change the shape of state by chucking it through, you know, by multiplying it by a matrix where the thing you multiply it by has a number of columns that you want to create, right? So, I just made sure that W3 has the same number of columns as as the H that we want had, and so as a result, by the by the end of this, we've got something which we can feed back into the RNN again. You know, we just need to make sure, you know, an RNN step can't change the shape that it started with, right? Because it needs to be able to keep going step, step, step. Every step needs to be the same tensor size. Um, you showed how you figured out, tested the tensor shapes. Um, how did you debug the attention class itself as a whole? Are RNNs easier and cleaner in PyTorch? Would the attention class have been relatively easier in PyTorch? What if I told you we were about to look at that? So the, the main thing for me to debug really was build, right? Because this bit is Jeffrey Hinton's, or Jeffrey Hinton's team's equations, right? There, there's not too much to get wrong here. Um, so really it was a case of like <coughs> um, doing it, yeah, as I say, like step by step in cells. Um, and printing out the shape at each point, and you'll see that like I created these, you know, all of these different dimensions at the start, right? And I made sure all of these numbers are different, so that every time I saw the number 64, I knew that was the batch size, and every time I saw 4, I knew that was the time steps, 32 was the input dim, 48 was the output dim. So I could go through and I could see, okay, here's my shape here, here's my shape here. Um, and then, you know, all I just did was I just chucked in some print statements, you know, print HW2, um, print U, print A, and so forth. And so um, I didn't need to see the contents of them. When you print a TensorFlow tensor like that, it prints the dimensions of it, which in my experience, once your dimensions work, you're done. And as long as you didn't make the mistake of having multiple things having the same number of dimensions. Because um, like, you know, as long as your dot product, you know, fits, and you know, if, if H and W2 didn't line up for rows and columns, you know, the error you get is pretty clear. You know, it'll be a TensorFlow, say these mismatch, and it'll tell you what the dimensions are, and so you can, you know, so generally speaking, getting these things to match isn't too bad. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it's no fun at all. Uh, But it's kind of menial, you know, you'll get there eventually. So now that it's done, you know, I've written it, right? So feel free to use it. Um, as you can see, it's easy to use. Um, and uh, at the end, um, you know, we get these pretty good results. Um, one thing to point out is when we go, um, um, so we get the predictions. Right by just saying model dot predict with our test set, right, um, and then those predictions, you'll notice we go split. Um, well, actually, it's really the later one. Uh, predictions, predict here, yeah. Uh, split on underscore. Why do we split on underscore? Um, that's because when I created the the vocabulary earlier on, I set underscore to be the zeroth element, and 
to remember that all of our words are padded at the end with zeros. So when the um, decoder predicts that this is the end of the word, it's going to spit out zero or underscore, right? So this is um, kind of how a decoder knows to stop. Now, it doesn't actually stop. Like in terms of computation, the decoder is still going to keep calculating all of the rest of the steps because we don't have the ability, at least in Keras, to say stop now. You know, everything's rectangles. So hopefully, um, the uh, decoder learns pretty quickly that if the previous token was underscore, the next token will always be underscore. Right? But once you've finished, you've stayed finished. Um, so that's a minor uh, issue there. Okay, so that's that. So we're going to have um, uh, a seven minute break, and when we come back, we're going to see this in PyTorch, and we're going to use it for actual language translation. So I'll see you at eight o'clock. So I am so happy to see. Um, so one of our students, um, Vincent, like uh, was at study group a couple of weeks ago, and was like writing all these like eigenvalues and eigenvectors equations. I was like, "What are you doing?" And he was like, well, "This idea, there's something in this style transfer that's like." Waiting to get out, and I can feel it. I was like, "Oh, it's interesting. Keep going, you know." And then last week, I like saw him doing some more, and he had some like some strange, noisy pictures on his screen. And then um, on Friday, you know, quite a few of us got together to do some hacking, and you know, I still saw him doing the same thing. And it's like, yeah, "I can feel it. I know there's something here. It's going to get close." And he just told me he sent me an email. So here is a photo. And here is a uh, painting, and here is the regular style transfer result, which is not bad. Um, and here is what happens when you use his new mathematical technique. It's so much better! So hopefully by next week I will understand this enough that either him or I can explain this to you. But I know um, one of the key differences is actually using the Earth movement's distance, which is the, the basis of the Wasserstein game, or Wasserstein game. Um, uh, I've managed to avoid teaching about eigenvalues and eigenvectors so far, <laughs> which, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how we're going to do that. Anyway, um, that is like, yeah, so there, this, this, this is, uh, um, where's Vincent? Yeah, this is this has got to be a paper. Like, yeah, you know, you've, you, this you've created a whole new technique. This is super exciting. So congratulations. Um, I look forward to learning more about it. You know, people just keep doing cool stuff. I love it. Um, you know, you guys are just sipping along. All right, so so let's translate English into French. Right now, here's a problem. the The teacher forcing his font. Oh, question. Oh, I was um, going to say just the two questions. I think from right before the break. Um, one was, um, could we use time distributed lambda right before the RNN? To okay. Apply those? So, so no, you you can't. Um, so, what this question is getting at is like, um, you know, why don't we use a lambda layer to do the, um, you know, the 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 attention calculations and then feed that into a standard RNN? But if remember. If, those calculations are being done inside the step function, right? So in other words, each step uses attention to calculate the output of the step, which impacts the next step. So it needs to be inside the RNN. You can't just pre-process the whole layer. And then the next question was, um, is there any reason why we used um, hyperbolic tan as opposed to sigmoid? Um, <clears throat> no, no reason at all. Um, so so um, hyperbolic tan and sigmoid are the same thing. Hyperbolic tan goes from minus 1 to 1, sigmoid goes from 0 to 1. Um, so. 
I think it's fine. Um, okay, teacher forcing was this thing where we're concatenating the um, the, the previous uh, correct answers embedding with our um, attention weighted encoder inputs um, in order to kind of help our um, uh, help our model to kind of keep track of where it ought to be, um, and that helps the training. Now, there's nothing wrong with training that way, but you can't use that at inference time, at test time, right? Because you don't know the correct answer. So my Keras model here is totally cheating. Right? I'm passing in the previous letter's correct answer to every step, but in real life I don't know that. So what we actually need to do is to, at inference time, you don't use teacher forcing, but instead you take the predicted previous step's result and feed it in to the next step. Okay, I have no idea how to do that in Keras. Like, it, it drove me crazy trying to figure out how to do that in Keras, and that was the thing that pushed me to PyTorch, right? Is I just... I was so sick of this goddamn attention layer, the idea of like going back and trying to put this thing in drove me crazy, and I, I, I don't even know how to do it. Furthermore, we actually want this to be dynamic. It turns out the best way... Um, if you use teacher forcing the whole time, you actually end up with a model that gets like sloppy. It like it learns to take advantage of the fact that it's about to be told what the previous thing should have been. So it kind of uses a more speculative approach, right? So actually, the best training uh, approach is as it goes through the epochs. Initially, it uses teacher forcing every time, and like halfway through. It uses teacher forcing randomly half the time, and at the last epoch, it doesn't use teacher forcing at all, right? So it kind of learns to wean itself off this extra information, and that kind of dynamic thing—that's really hard, or maybe even impossible to do in Keras. So for all these reasons, um, I moved to PyTorch, right? Um, I haven't. Done all of these things in PyTorch. I've done most of them, but like the the dynamic changing of teacher forcing, I've actually left for one of you guys to, to try out. Anyway, the basic ideas are all here. So let's look at the PyTorch version. Interestingly, the PyTorch version, in terms of like the attention model itself, turns out to be way easier. Um, but we have to write more code because there's less structure for NLP models. Like for, for computer vision stuff, there's the PyTorch vision project, which has all that data loading and models and blah blah blah. We don't seem to have an NLP kind of version of that. So there's a bit more code to write here. Um, anyway, so let's translate English to French. And so um, what I did was I downloaded this, um, uh, this Giga French um, corpus. Um, which I'll put a link to on the wiki. Um, and basically, this is a really cool idea. What this researcher did was he went to lots of Canadian websites um, and, and used a screen scraper to figure out whether there was a little button saying switch from English to French, and the screen scraper would automatically click the button and then assume that those two screens were the same. Right? And then he tokenized them into sentences and provides this corpus of like a billion words. Um, so this is pretty great. Um, <clears throat> I didn't really want to create like a complete uh, English-French translator because I just didn't have the time to run it for long enough. So I tried to think, okay, what's like a an interesting subset of English to French? So I thought, okay, what if we learn to translate English questions that start with WH? So what, who, where, why, right? You know. And so when I looked at it. It turned out that um, that was oh, um, that was something you know that was like eighty thousand or something. There's a lot of sentences basically, but the nice thing is that all of those sentences are you know have a somewhat similar structure. So it's like it's it, it, we're going to learn everything about translating English into French, but we're going to be doing it with a slight subset. 
So that's why I did this um, regex, which says, okay, look for things that start with wh and end with a question mark in English, and where the French can be anything at all, but it should end with a question mark. Okay, so um, I um, went through uh, the French uh, and English um, files. Um, this is this really cool trick we've mentioned once before, that once you go open in Python that returns a generator that you can loop through, and so if you zip the two together you've got the English questions and the French questions, um, and then just go through and um, run the regex, um, and then return the ones that the, both of the regex matched. Okay, so here's, some, um, here's the first six examples. So that looks good. And as you can see, a lot of them are really simple, um, and um, you know some of them are more complex. Um, as per usual, dump that in a pickle file so we can load it in quickly later. All right, so we've got the English questions and the French questions. Um, I'm going to show you all the steps for real-world NLP, so you can like see all the pieces. And we're going to do everything by hand, um, so you can get a sense of exactly what happens. So the next step uh, is tokenization. So tokenization is uh, taking a sentence and turning it into a number, of, uh, basically into words. Right? But this is not quite straightforward because, like, what's a word, right? So is um, is that a word, right? Or is that a word? Or is that a word, right? And so you know, I had to make some decisions based on my view of what was likely to work. And which is basically is like, okay, I think that's a word, right? So I just wrote some regular expressions, right, for doing kind of heuristic tokenization. Now you can use um, an LTK, the Natural Language Toolkit, that has a bunch of tokenizers in. Um, honestly, though, I actually found my hacky rules-based tokenizer like I was happier with it than any of the NLT tokenizers I tried um, for this problem. Um, so you can see that basically, um, for example, if you have uh, any letter followed by apostrophe s, right, then I want you to make apostrophe s a word, right, because it's, it's kind of more like of than anything else. Um, or else if it's um, a letter followed by an apostrophe followed by a letter, that's probably French, in which case everything up to the apostrophe is one word and everything after it is another word, right? So you can basically see it here. Um, tokenize uh, the French que, es, que, la, lumière. Okay? Uh, that is exactly what I want. Um, and here's the English, right? And so then let's test a very accurate statement like Rachel's baby is cuter than others's. And you can see here the apostrophe s's, okay, doing the right thing as opposed to the apostrophes in the middle. Okay, so Check out my tokenizer, all looks good, um, makes accurate statements about Rachel's baby as well, so all good. Um, so now that we've got that tokenizing, we can go ahead and like do the standard thing that we do every time we work with NLP, which is to turn our list of words into a list of numbers. Okay, We always do it the same way basically, um, create our vocabulary, what are all of the possible words and how often they appear, um, insert a padding character. <clears throat> insert the start of stream character. This is like the asterisk in the previous one. Um, uh, create the reverse mapping from word to ID by using this little enumerate trick, and then go through every sentence and turn it into a list of tokens by calling that dictionary. Um, and you have a question behind you, Rachel. Do you need a stammer before you convert into numbers? No, no, not at all. Um, we we um, different uh, words with different stems are different words and have different translations. So we want to keep that that whole thing. You know, uh, the tokenizer really is just to is to do something that we think we can do in a purely rules based way. The question of like how do we deal with um, morphological differences is actually highly complex, varies a lot by language, and we want to learn it in neural net. All right, so this is going to end up returning the lists of IDs for each sentence, the vocabulary, uh, the reverse vocabulary, and just a uh, um, frequency counts for the vocabulary. Great. Um, next step is to um, turn these words into word vectors. So 
Um, earlier on we used word to vec because word to vec has these like multi-word things, but for translation I don't want multi-word things, I want single word things, so that's why I'm going to use glove. Uh, so go ahead and turn that into a dictionary from the word to the word vector. Um, also grab some French word vectors. I uh, found uh, this really fantastic site that's got some nice French word vectors. Um, and so now go ahead and build a little thing that can go through my vocabulary, um, create a big uh, array of zeros, and then go ahead and fill in all of those zeros with word vectors, uh, if you can. Of course, sometimes you look up a word and it's not in your word vector, word vector list, in which case you can just stick a random vector in there instead. So this is all stuff we've done many, many times now. Um, I also am keeping track of how often I find the word, just to make sure, and for English, out of 19,500 in the vocab, we find 17.2 thousand um, word vectors in glove, so this is looking pretty good. So most of our word vectors are being found. And for French, a little bit less, but still not bad. That's probably because of my particular tokenization strategy. Um, might have been different for the tokenization strategy they used for these word vectors. Um, you still have the audio popping, crackling problem from time to time. Oh, I, I, sorry. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I, 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 I still have it in the same mode as last time, so I think we've used all the tricks we know. So thanks for letting us know. It's a bummer. Uh, okay, and then of course the other thing we have to do with NLP um, <laughs> is to make everything rectangular. Um, notice here I'm calling a Keras function. Right? If Keras does something you need, please use it, even if you're in PyTorch, it's fine. Right? Um, yeah, I've, I've heard a number of people say, oh, I'm trying to use PyTorch, but I hate that it doesn't have pad sequences. It's like, well, if you import pad sequences, it has pad sequences. Um, train test split to grab 10% uh, of the data um, for train versus test. And here we have it, right? So. Uh, 47,000 train, 5,000 test. And uh, here's an example of a French sentence and the English sentence, and all the padding. Um, so we tend to have to now have to do all the data loading stuff ourselves, right? So I've gone ahead and created a get batch function that is going to go ahead and um, return a um, random permutation uh, of len x, so len x is the length of um, all of our sentences, so this is going to return and then grab the first batch size of them. So this will return 16 random numbers between 0 and 47,097, um, and so then I can just return those for English and those for French. So it's okay if you don't have a data loader, right? This is all it actually takes to create a basic generator. Right? This is basically doing the same thing as a generator if you don't need any uh, data augmentation. Um, and again, you know, here's a piece of code you can steal, right? If you need a generator in PyTorch, here's, here's a generator in PyTorch. Pass in your um, data and your labels and your batch size and it will return um, a batch of each. All right, so um, I don't really have time to show you this. I mentioned last time that uh, I created um, uh, broadcasting functions for PyTorch. Um, basically what had happened was I had all this Keras code that worked, and I wanted to port it to PyTorch. And PyTorch doesn't have broadcasting, so none of this stuff worked. And like, so my PyTorch was like way more complex than my Keras, because there was dot squeeze and dot unsqueeze and dot expands everywhere. So I wrote add, subtract, multiply, divide, and dot, uh, such that they had the exact same broadcasting semantics as Keras. Um, uh, this is actually pretty interesting, and I really wish I had time to show you, but maybe you can have a look at it during the week and ask questions on the forum, because um, there's so little code, right? So the amount of code to make all of that work is uh, basically that and that. Uh, it's incredibly little code. 
Um, but importantly, I also want to show you how I build this stuff. Um, I always use test-driven development for this kind of thing. So basically, I created a whole bunch of um, matrices, vectors, um, three-dimensional tensors, and four-dimensional tensors, transposed versions of them, wrote something that checks the two things are the same, um, and then I just go to head, went ahead and like tried making sure that all of, you know, all of these things ought to be the same as all of these other things. And uh, first of all, I wrote it, you know, all of the tests, um, and then I gradually went through and put in code so that the tests started passing. Um, and then I went back and kept refactoring the code uh, until it was simpler and simpler. Um, so you can see in the end, you know, all of my little functions are nice and small. And what this meant was I could now write an attention model using almost exactly the same notation as before. Um, you know, so that was how I created these broadcasting operators. <clears throat> okay, so given that they exist, um, here is a non-attention encoder. Um, and so you can see basically all it is is create some embeddings, um, create a GRU, um, and then in the forward pass, run the embeddings, and then run the GRU on that. Okay? And in PyTorch, uh, a GRU, uh, you, can, you don't have to actually write three GRUs next to each other, you can just say number of layers equals, and that's going to stack the GRUs on top of each other. Okay. So that's that. Um, um, pretty straightforward. Um, the decoder um, is also pretty straightforward. Um, again, create the embeddings, um, create the GRU, um, except for the decoder we also need a linear layer at the end, and care asks us to be a dense layer, which is the correct size for our output vocabulary. Right? We actually have to remember for that inference time, we don't just want the state, we actually want to get out something that we can like do an argmax on to find out like which word have we just translated this into. So we need this, this layer to turn it into the correct size right, for the, for the voc French vocabulary size. Um, so the forward pass here, this is a little different as you'll see when we get to where we actually use this. This is actually just um, um, a single step. Um, and so this is basically just you doing one letter at a time, as you'll see when we get here. Um, and here's the actual softmax on the dense layer that we created. So it's just embedding, grew, dense layer, softmax. Okay? Um, and we return both the new hidden state, which we'll be using um, for the next step, as well as the actual you know, result of the output. All right, that's all fine. So here's the um, attention decoder, and as you can see, rather than being a hundred lines of code, it's a screen and a half. Right? Um, and the nice thing is, this is all basically the same as Keras. Right? My W123, my B23, my V, my GRU, right? and then my final output. <laughs> um, and then this is basically all the same as Keras as well. Right? So I've got my, my dot and add, then multiply, softmax, here's the weighted sum, here's that cat, here's the W3, add on the bias, all the GRU, and then dense layer and softmax. And again, uh, we both return the um, actual predictions as well as the hidden states. Now, um, the thing is, we have to write our own training loop, right? because this is PyTorch. So we're going to have to go ahead and do a bit more work here. Right? So basically, here's the code that trains an epoch. <laughs> Right? Create an optimizer for the encoder, an optimizer for the decoder. Uh, the criterion is you know, what they call the, the loss function, negative log likelihood. That's the same as the cross entropy. Um, here's that get batch function we created ourselves earlier to grab one batch of French and English, put them onto the GPU, 
and then call train, we'll look at that in a moment, keep track of the loss, from time to time print out the loss. Alright, so all the work's actually happening in train, which is here. So like each of these things is less than a screen of code, but it's still, you know, we had to write it ourselves. Um, so um, encode our um, decoder and encoder, um, and remember with PyTorch you have to manually call zero grad, right? So you have to zero out the gradient at the start of your training loop, uh, and then go through uh, each um, word um, in your target, so we've already encoded it, and call the decoder, passing in the decoder input, the hidden state, and the encoder outputs. Um, and so then next decoder input comes out from there, uh, keep check of the loss, and then we have to call dot backward manually, we have to call the optimizer step manually, um, and return it. So it's not very interesting code, um, and it's the kind of stuff which I suspect, you know, hopefully the PyTorch community and maybe some of us will all be able to contribute to getting rid of all of this boilerplate kind of code, kind of Keras style um, over time. I'm sure that'll happen. Um, anyway, for now, there's the code. Um, now that it's there, we can create our encoder, we can create our attention decoder, we can train it for a while, um, and then we can test it. Now for testing, I need another function, right, because I want to turn off teacher forcing. Right? So you'll see in this function, um, this is not very well refactored, I've copied some code here, but again, basically I, I encode, and then I go through my target length, call the decoder, but look here, I now take my decoder output and find the top one. So this is basically argmax, right? So this is saying, okay, what, what word did we predict? So we're not using teacher forcing, we're not saying what was the actual word, because that would be cheating, we're saying what word did we predict, right? So that um, now becomes the input to the next loop, right? So this is how we've turned off teacher forcing. So the kind of exercise for one or more of you guys this week, if you're interested, is to do the thing I told you earlier, which is to kind of combine this with the training loop and make the training loop as it goes through the epochs gradually move from always using teacher forcing to over time randomly using it less and less and less until at the very end it never uses teacher forcing and always uses this. Um, if you get that working, um, which is, won't take you long, I think it's pretty straightforward, um, you'll get better test results than I'm showing you here. Okay, anyway, let's test it. So to do a French to English, we basically are going to take our French sentence, turn it into a list of IDs by tokenizing it and turning it into IDs, padding it with zeros, call that evaluate function I just showed you, and then join it together, and there it is. So this was the correct English, uh, this was the French we were given, and this was our prediction. So you know, it's not the same, but it's still correct, um, you know, uh, as a speaker. So that's, that's looking pretty good. Right. So there it is, there's translation. Um, I guess there's a couple of things I wanted to briefly mention. Um, one is, and these are all stuff that you, you guys can play with if you're interested. Um, this decoding loop, um, there's much better ways to do it. Right? What I'm doing here, by taking the top one every time, is I'm assuming in the decoder that the, the top prediction is the correct one. But what if like two words were nearly 50-50? Right? This is 51%, this one's 49%. And I go, oh, it's definitely the 51%. Right? That might be a bad idea. Right? And so I'm going to actually steal some slides um, from Graham Newbig from the NARA Institute of Science Technology who has shown a fantastic, um, simple example of what you could do instead. So um, he's doing something slightly different, which is to say, um, what if we had a sentence um, 
like natural language processing bracket, NLP bracket, and your job was to figure out uh, not how to translate it, but to figure out what part of speech each of those things were. Um, these uh, weird letters are um, pen, tree bank, part of speech tags. N is uh, noun, J is adjective, VB is verb, left bracket, right bracket. So the correct answer is that um, natural is an adjective, and language is a noun, and processing is a noun, and so forth. This would be the correct path through these options. Now, how would you create this path? Well, you could start out by figuring out how likely um, uh, natural is in language in general to be a noun versus an adjective versus a verb and so forth. And then having done that, for every single one of those, you could figure out how likely it is for every one of these to then be a noun, and then to be an adjective, and then to be a verb, and so forth. And you could keep repeating this process, um, adding up the log predictions all the way along, all the way to the end, um, and pick the path which was the best. Now the problem is, of course, is that that's basically 5 times 5 times 5, just if you only had 5 choices, you know, exponentially complex. And remember, in our case we're not picking from 5 things, we're picking from 40,000 or 20,000 or whatever, you know, the, the vocabulary of our French language things. So this is called the Viterbi algorithm. So uh, the Viterbi algorithm for machine translation is NP-complete. Uh, if you haven't come across that before, it basically means Forget it. Okay, so um, let's not do that, um, but I'm sure you can see how obvious the, the answer is. Rather than doing the Viterbi algorithm, why don't we just pick the top few hypotheses so far? Right? So if um, here are uh, the scores for what is the word natural, it's <laughs> probably not a left bracket, it's probably not a right bracket, right? It might be one of these. Okay, well let's assume it's one of the top three. Right? Okay, so given it's one of the top three, what might be next? Right? And again, let's just pick the top three combinations and keep going through that. Right? This is called beam search. In practice, every state-of-the-art algorithm for neural language translation uses this for decoding. Now, Writing this, again, it's going to be less than a screen of code. I haven't written it. Why not go write it? You know, this week, add it to this code. Add beam search. Like it's, um, here's the entire pseudocode, right? And, and I'm sure you could write it in probably less code than that. Um, so there's beam search. There's one thing to mention. You got something, Rachel? Uh, we have two questions, but kind of going back to your notebook. Yeah, go for it. I'm done with theme search. Um, one is, do you know if there are any training methods that capture the fact that what is the population of Canada and what is Canada's population are very nearly the same? Um, no, I don't, but I'm, I'm not sure it even matters because um, on average, you know, you're, you know a, a better system will be one which you know, translates those 50% of the time into one versus the other. Like, the, the, best, the best translator approach I don't think is going to vary depending on the answer to that question, so I'm not sure that it's that important. Right, and then um, could we translate between Chinese and English using uh, the same method? Yes, we can, but um, it would be better if we use the technique I'm going to show you next. So the technique I'm going to show you next is described in This paper, um, Neural Machine Translation of Rare Words with Subword Units. So interestingly, this actually came up today when I was chatting to Brad, and Brad was asking me, how do I create um, an analysis of people's tweets using their particular vocabulary, but make it like, you know, not fall apart if they use some word in the future that I haven't seen before? Right? Um, and that's a very similar question to how do I translate language when somebody uses a word I haven't seen before, or more generally, you know, maybe I don't want to use 160,000 words in my vocabulary, that's a huge embedding matrix, it takes a lot of memory, it takes a lot of time, it's going to be hard to train, so what do you do? 
And so the answer is um, you use something called um, BPE, um, which is um, it's basically an encoder, and what it's going to do is it's going to take uh, a sentence um, like "Hello, I am Jeremy." Full stop, comma. And it's going to basically say, "Okay." I'm going to try and turn this into a list of tokens that aren't necessarily the same as the words. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at every pair of letters, H, E, E, L, 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 O, and so forth, for my whole training set. I'm going to say which pair of letters is the most common. Right? And so maybe the answer is um, E, R. Right? So I take those two. And I turn them into a so we start off with like every character separate. So we're now going to combine these into a single entity called ER, right? And then I go through and I do that again. And maybe the next answer is um, that actually AM appears a lot. So then I'm going to take that and turn that into AM. And so maybe the next thing is actually ERE is the next most common thing I can find. So now we take this. And replace it with E R E. And you keep doing this, right? You never cross word boundaries, right? So in theory, we could do this forever until we end up eventually with the words again. But instead, what happens with this um, BPE encoder is you provide a single parameter, which is what is the maximum number of combiners you want to do. Like a common default would be like 10,000. So at the end of that, you're going to end up with like 10,000 um, subword sequences. So it will end up like turning this sentence into something like H E L L O, um, and then there's a special end of word, so space um, I space M space. Maybe it'll be then be like J, and then E R E, and then M Y. Something like that, right? Now the cool thing is that you can do this by um, going to this GitHub site and downloading this and running it on your um, on your uh, um, on your file of, of, of prose, and it will spit out. Um, the exact same thing, but it's going to it'll stick um, at at space between every one of these BPE codes, right? So in other words, to use this with what I just showed you, you don't have to write any code. You can just take the English and the French sentences, run it through this, and it will spit out um, you know BPE encoded versions of those. Um, Having said that, you know, I think maybe the optimal approach would be to actually write something which first of all figured out like which are the most common 20,000 words or 10,000 words and left those words alone and maybe only run then the BPE encoding on the on the things that are truly rare words. Cuz sometimes BPE encoding actually splits things up in ways that isn't quite what you want. Right. Um, anyway, so this is a super important technique, and so for Chinese, um, you know, for those of you that speak Chinese, you know that it's actually not at all clear where words begin and end. I mean, not only are there no spaces, but grammatically in Chinese, um, there are. Um, um, well, one example would be you can have a sequence of two verbs where the um, sorry, a verb and an adjective. Or a verb and a verb, which basically the second verb or adjective describes the result of the first one, and so like you could treat that as a single word, be a perfectly reasonable thing to do, or you could treat it as three words, that would also be a perfectly reasonable thing to do, and there's no right answer, right? And this kind of weird stuff happens all the time in Chinese. Um, uh, you can insert the, the character ne into the middle of a two um, a two character verb. And it turns that into a new word, which means that that thing can't be done. 
Uh, is this a new word? Is it now three words? It, it's, it's very hard to tell. So instead, if you use BPE with Chinese, uh, you can kind of tokenize it in a way that's entirely statistical. So I think that would be the answer to that question. Okay, so I want to leave translation there because I desperately wanted to insert um, a discussion about segmentation, because like we kept on talking about segmentation, and um, um, I really kind of realized in the last week how exciting a particular path of segmentation has turned out to be, and I really, really, really wanted to explain it to you before the end of the course. So I'm going to do um, half of it today and half of it next week, um, if we can. Um, so let me show you why this is exciting. So segmentation is about um, taking something like this and turning it into something like this, where every color represents a thing. So this kind of pink is road, this light purple is line, this blue is footpath, this purple is car, this red is building, and so forth. Okay? So this is quite a challenging thing to do, but it's really important uh, for anything that's going to understand the world, react to it. So clearly robotics and self-driving cars absolutely have to be able to do this very quickly and very accurately. Um, but really a whole range of computer vision problems need to be able to do this. Um, for example, um, last week we saw um, um, uh, that hackathon winning entry from a couple of our students that was able to say, um, take this cat and blur it out, or apply this style transfer to this cat, or whatever. So you need a way of being able to know exactly where the cat is. Um, and for something like, um, one of the things they showed was um, remove the background. Now you actually need to be able to do a really good job of segmenting out the cat, because if you get it slightly wrong, then you remove the background. You know, you often see this like when people use Photoshop badly. You know, you'll end up with like the bit between the ears, you know, is still there, or you know, their fur looks really spiky or something. So, if you want to create the next generation Photoshop, you need to be really good at this. Um, so there's lots of reasons to need to be really good at this. Now it turns out that the, there's a fantastic way of doing this with a fantastic name called the Hundred Layers Tiramisu. Um, and the 100 layers tiramisu is a fully convolutional dense net. And so therefore, we're not going to look at this yet. Instead, we're going to look at the dense net, um, because we can't understand the tiramisu without the dense net. So here is the paper that introduced the dense net. As it turns out, um, um, you really, really need to also know about the dense net for other reasons. And let me show you the reason. I, I, it's only recently I fully appreciated this. Um, here is the results for the dense net, and if you look down here, you will recognize that it is being compared to genuinely state-of-the-art stuff, right? So network and network, highway network, fractal net, ResNet, ResNet with stochastic depth, and wide ResNet. Okay, these are genuinely state-of-the-art architectures, and it's being looked at on some um, heavily studied data sets. This is SciFar 10, this is SciFar 100. Um, plus is with data augmentation, without plus is without data augmentation. So SciFar 100, the previous state of the art, this is like massively well studied, was 28. Right? And that itself was way above everybody else. This paper got 19 and a half. Like, you guys have seen enough of these now to know that you don't decrease by 30 plus percent with computer vision nowadays against state-of-the-art results. So this is like a huge advance. Now the reason this huge advance is important, because specifically these no data augmentation columns, so here's the here's SciFar 10 one, similar thing, right, going down from 7.3 to 5.1, you know, that's a 20 or 30 percent decrease as well. Um, what these represent, these, these without data augmentation columns, they basically represent the performance of this data set on um, a limited amount of data. 
Right? If you're not using data augmentation, you're basically forcing it to have to work with less data. And like, I know that a huge number of you are wanting to build stuff where you don't have much data. So if you're one of those people, you definitely need to use DenseNet. Right? At this stage, DenseNet is by far the state-of-the-art result for data sets where you don't have much data. Right? So, um, so I want to teach you about dense nets for two reasons. The first is so that next week we can learn about the tiramisu, the hundred layer tiramisu, but also so that we can find out how to create way, 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 way better um, computer vision models where you have limited data. Okay, so let's learn how to do this. Um, and I can actually describe it in a simple sentence, a single sentence. Um, a dense net is a ResNet where you replace addition with concatenation. Now that's actually the entirety of what a dense net is. But understanding that what it is and why it works is um, more involved. So let's remind ourselves about ResNet. Okay, we've looked at this many times, but there's no harm in, in just reminding ourselves. With ResNet, we have some input. Um, have some input, we put it through a convolution to get some activations, and another convolution to get some activations, and we also have the identity. And this is addition. Right? So basically we end up with our kind of, our, um, you know, layer t plus 1 equals um, some function, you know, the convolutions, that is, of layer t plus layer t itself. Right? And then to remind you, what I've normally shown after that is then to say, okay, so our function equals The difference. So it's basically calculating the residual. It's calculating a function that can find the error. Right? So every time we look at ResNet, we, we look at it this way. Okay, so what if we do exactly the same thing, but we replace that with concatenate, join them together. And remember, this is just one block, right? So we've got like block, 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 block. So what that means is that, you know, after the first layer, we have both the result of some convolutions and the original input, because we like literally copied it and concatenated it. And then after the second layer, we've got some convolutions on convolutions and the original first layer of convolutions and the original input. Right? And furthermore, that second layer of convolutions was itself operating on this concat, so that second layer of uh, convolutions was operating both on the original data as well as on the outcome of the first set of convolutions. So when people draw dense nets, they tend to draw it like this. They show like every layer going to every layer after it. Now I didn't define it that way because it's much easier in practice to implement it by just saying each layer equals all of the previous layer concatenated with the convolution on top of the previous layer. And so you concatenate recursively means that you always have all of your previous layers there as well. Right? So sometimes people get confused when they see this picture where everything is shown connecting to each other but then you look at the code, and it looks like it's only connected to the previous layer. And that's because the previous layer itself was connected to the previous layer, which was connected to the previous layer. Okay, so because we keep concatenating, the number of filters is getting bigger and bigger. Right? So we're going to have to be careful not to add too many filters at each layer. So 
the number of filters that are added at each layer they call the growth rate. And for some reason they use the letter K. That is K for growth rate. <laughs> um, they tend to use the values of 12 or 24. In the tiramisu paper they tend to use the value of 16. So every layer has 12 more filters than the previous layer. And you generally can have like 100 layers. Right? So after 100 layers you could have 1200 or 2400 filters, which is getting to be quite a lot. Um, yeah, so be it. So interestingly, although they, they kind of add up, you actually end up with less parameters than normal. So you can see that this year, SciFAR 10, even this is a state-of-the-art result, 7%, um, and this is with only a million parameters, right? So this is beating ResNet with 10 million parameters by a third. Right? So this is why it's working so well with so little data. <coughs> um, I'm not convinced that this is the right approach for um, or that it's a massively better approach for ImageNet. Right? This is the picture for ImageNet. Um, this is the important one. Um, the number of flops, so this is the number of floating point operations, the amount of time that it takes your computer to do it, um, versus the error rate. Um, you can see that DenseNet and ResNet have about the same error rate, and DenseNet's like nah, half you know, it's about twice as fast, a bit less. Like, it's still better, but it's not like massively better. And um, there are actually better architectures than ResNet for um, for ImageNet nowadays. So, uh, so really, um, if you're using something that's more of the 100 to 100,000 images range, you probably want to be using DenseNet. If it's more than 100,000 images, yeah, maybe it doesn't matter so much. Okay, so you want to see the code? No, just a moment. So interestingly, this turned out to be something that um, suited Keras really well. Um, this is a, you know, these kind of like things where you're using standard kinds of layers connected in different ways. Um, Keras is fantastically great for it, um, as you'll see. So uh, I'm going to use SciFAR 10. Um, I just copied and pasted this basically from the Keras, um, keras.datasets.scifar10. Um, so there's an example of SciFAR 10. Um, it's a funny old dataset, just 32 by 32 pixel images, um, so that's what a SciFAR 10 truck looks like. Um, they're from 0 to 255. Uh, sorry, they're from 0 to 255. I want to make them 0 to 1, so I divide them by 255. All right. So we're going to try to figure out that this is a truck. We have 10 categories in SciFAR 10. Um, so the less code that you write, the less chance that there is for an error. Right. So um, I try to refactor out everything that happens more than once. Um, and so even a simple thing like activation ReLU, <laughs> I create a function for it. Dropout, if you have dropout, I create a function for it. Match norm, with a particular mode and axis, is a function for And then applying ReLU on top of batch norm is a function for it. Right? Um, convolutions, I always have this in it, this border mode, uh, this L2 regularization, and this dropout, so there's a function for it. Um, then we have uh, batch norm, then ReLU, then convolution and dropout, so there's a function for it. Um, in the paper they also have something called a bottleneck layer. This is a one by one convolution where I um, basically uh, um, compress the number of filters down um, into um, the uh, growth factor times four. 
right? And so this is a way of reducing the uh, dimensionality. Uh, you'll see here, um, when they use um, bottleneck and something called compression, we'll see in a moment, uh, they call it dense net BC, and you can see that that reduces the number of parameters even more, and therefore makes it even more accurate. Right? So um, generally speaking, you'll probably be wanting to use bottleneck, um, but it's just a one-by-one -one conv with, uh, in this case, 48 filters. So it's reducing the dimensionality um, through that. So basically, um, what happens in um, um, is, is you have a number of dense blocks. Uh, each dense block basically consists of a number of these um, uh, convolutions, followed by concatenation. Right? So go through each layer, convolution, concatenate. And you see how I'm actually replacing x with it. Right? So it's concatenating to itself again and again, so it's getting longer and longer. Right? And then, from time to time, um, I then add in a transition block, which is simply a one-by-one -one convolution followed by a pooling layer. Right? So just like every computer vision model we're used to, a bunch of computation layers, and then pool. Bunch of computation, pool, bunch of computation, pool. Um, so this is, looks like a pretty standard kind of um, architecture. Um, oh, and then the, I mentioned compression. Um, the other thing then is in each transition block, um, you can optionally have this thing called compression, which normally you would set up to 0 0.5, that just says, okay, the number of filters, um, take however many filters you currently have and multiply it by 0 0.5. So this is basically something where every time you have a pooling layer, you also decrease the number of filters. So when you have this bottleneck layer and you have this compression of 0 0.5, that's what dense net BC refers to. <coughs> yes? Um, can we do transfer learning on dense net? Um, absolutely you can. Um, um, and in fact, PyTorch just came, the new version just came out yesterday or today, and has dense net, pre has some pre-trained dense net models. So, um, having said that, because the, um, the size of the activations continues to increase and increase and increase, we again have this problem that there isn't really a nice kind of um, small number of activations that you could really build on top of. So I'm not sure I'm not sure how practical it would be, but you certainly could. Um, all right. So here is the whole dense net model. Um, basically, um, there's uh, four layers which aren't part of the dense blocks, um, which is that there's an initial three by three convolution. Um, there's a global average pooling layer, and there's also a ReLU and a batch norm. So if you subtract the four, and then divide by the number of dense blocks, that tells you how many layers you need for every block. Um, so we do our 3x3 three three conv, then we go through each of those, la um, those layers, create a dense block, and for every one except for the last layer, we also do a transition block, so that's the one with the pooling. Um, finally do a batch norm, ReLU, global average pooling, um, and then a dense layer to create the right number of classes. Um, so that's basically it. If you create that, uh, compile it, uh, and fit it. Um, so I ran it last night, and so I couldn't quite run it as long as they did, but I did get to 93.23. Which uh, easily beats all of the state of the art. That's somewhere about uh, six and a bit. So uh, I didn't have time to run it for as long as they did, but I certainly replicated their state of the art result. Um, and you know, as you can see, using nothing but uh, basically two screenfuls of carrots. Um, so I read through that pretty quickly, but uh, honestly, this is all stuff that you guys are pretty familiar with. So if you Read the paper, it's a really easy paper to read. Um, read the code, it's really easy code to read. If you haven't done much like implementing 
papers with code, this is a great place to start because it's like there's no math in the paper, um, it's pretty clear, the Keras code is really easy to read, there's no new concepts, so like this would be a great way to get started. Um, and as I said, you know, the students and I, um, some of the students and I basically started on this on Friday um, and uh, got it knocked out. So I think this is pretty exciting. All right, so it's nine o'clock. Thanks everybody. Uh, looking forward to chatting to you during the week and I'll see you on next Monday for our last class. <laughs>